lighting to get the more a little more light in the room. A lot of times it's, it's dark because we're trying to get the video for the uh, internet services and all that good stuff set so it can be usable. So unfortunately, I have to look at you now. So <laughs> you're a beautiful crowd to look upon. I should probably stop and pray. I can't tell you. I, I had to set it a railroad track a little longer than I wanted to. And, you know, I wouldn't mind it if there was a train. <laughs> so finally I realized I'm no longer under law but under grace and went around and just got here. So y'all pray for me as I've confessed my sins. You know, some things override the others. I wouldn't have gone around if a train had been there, all right? <laughs> Obviously. Not without some problems. But it is good to see you today. We begin a new study today. We'll be in for maybe eight to ten weeks or so where we're talking about apostasy. And this has to do with the last days that I believe we are in and a departure from the faith. The Bible says in Jude, we shall earnestly contend for the faith. This is a, probably one of the smallest books in the Bible. Uh, probably one of the most neglected or ignored books in the Bible. But probably needs to be looked at right now during the times we're living in as much as any other scripture that we see before us. It's an important book because it deals with what we are facing in the culture that we're in, and that is a turning away from the faith, the doctrines, the scripture, the word of God that was delivered to us once for all, as the Bible says. When it says once for all, it means that settles it. You know, there, we can't add to it. We can't take from it. In fact, we know the scriptures have warnings about that, don't they? About adding to and taking from. So we're not going to print our own Bible up. Jehovah Witness or Mormons or whatever you might be. We're going to believe the Word of God as it's given to us, and we're going to trust the Word of God. But the Bible tells us in the last days there'll be a departure from that. People, in the name of Christianity, will begin to uh, depart from the truth of the Word of God. The denial of the virgin birth, the denial of the resurrection, the denial of the second coming of Christ. Many doctrines uh, that have been disregarded by many mainline denominations. Uh, I really don't even know what they're preaching anymore. <laughs> Nonetheless, uh, it's obviously not the Word of God. They've rejected the truth of Scriptures. That is a big part of what happens in the last days. Greater delusion so that people just believe lies, and it, not only they believe lies, they embrace lies, and they reject the truth of God's Word. We're just going to try to get to a couple of verses today, and I'll try to do two things. One is introduce the book, and two is to zero in on a, a couple of verses, I think, that are very important as you get into the study of the book of Jude. And why we need to study it is, is tremendously important because these are the days that we are presently living in. Let's just talk about the book itself. The book of Jude is, 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 is exciting, it's a small book. You know, the book of Acts gives us what we call the Acts of the Apostle as, as the church began its early days. The book of Jude describes the Acts of the Apostates. And so where you see in one book all the works of the Holy Spirit and of godly men, now you begin to see the works of ungodly men. It's the only book that's entirely devoted to teaching about the end time apostasy. I mean, it's mentioned by other authors, it's mentioned by the Lord Jesus Christ that there'll be this departing from the faith in the end times. And that's what it means to depart from the faith, to fall away. But I want to make very clear to you as we study this, it doesn't mean that Christians, people who are truly born again, will fall away, that they'll be apostates. It's talking about pretend believers. Remember the parable of the sower and the seeds and how the sower went out and he sowed seeds and you know, and the field came up and there was wheat that was growing, but there was also weeds amongst the wheat called tare. And they look alike and they grow about the same rate. And you would think one is wheat when it really isn't, it's just weed. But when it reaches a certain height, it doesn't put off the grain. There's no fruit. There's no head on it, which we'll talk about a little bit later in our study on apostasy. But that is a great picture of someone who is really what you might call a counterfeit believer, a, a make-believe believer. They're not the genuine thing. But the Bible does talk about a great falling away. Jesus mentioned it in Luke when he says, when the Son of Man returns, will he find faith on the earth? Let me go back to that right quick. And there's also the Apostle Peter mentions it. Uh, in fact, as Peter talks about it, he, he speaks of it in the context of his coming. Jude says it's here. The Apostle Paul, John spoke of it, James speaks of it. Now Jude, the whole book is pretty much just dedicated to the details of the apostasy and what it means when there's a great falling away. It's a reiteration of the Apostle Paul when he said in 2 Timothy chapter, 1 Timothy chapter 4, but the Spirit explicitly says that in the latter times some will fall away from the faith, paying attention to deceitful spirits and doctrines of demons. 
Now, whether you realize what that says or not, it basically is saying the devil's going to be working in the church in the last days. And he's going to be doing everything he can within the church to pervert the faith. That's why Jude says, I'm contending for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. It's, it's settled. No changes need to be made to it. It's taken care of. And we need to believe what God says. But he says, in the last days, it won't be like that. There'll be teaching of demons. Uh, Greek is didaskalios demonis, which means there'll be doctrines or teachings from Satan, which will be introduced into the body of Christ so as to deceive people, so that people won't relieve the real Jesus. They won't accept the real faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the way it starts. Jude, a bondservant of Jesus Christ, the brother of James, to those who are called beloved in God the Father and kept for Jesus Christ. May mercy and peace and love be multiplied to you. So that's the way the, the book starts, as he gives the, the, the name of the book, and the author of the book is, is listed for us as Jude. And we take a moment to just to introduce who, who he is. It's the Greek word, basically, Judas. Uh, and obviously, I think for reasons, there's a little change of Judas's name, whereby he's writing it, he calls it Jude. He calls himself Jude, he doesn't call himself Judas. So he makes a little change in the way it's written. And obviously, you know, I've, my name was Judas, I, I'm going to change myself to Jude too, you know. Uh, Judas is not the kind of guy we want to carry, carry that name around. He's the, he's the writer of the one book that deals with apostasy of the end times. And it's interesting that the book about apostasy uh, is named after the, the apostate of all times, Judas himself. But as he gets in the book, he, he makes some clarity about why he's writing the book. But by the way, there are about five different guys in scriptures that are named Ju uh, uh, Jude or Judas. And he calls himself Jude, the, the servant of Jesus Christ and the brother of James. There are five men who are named Judas. Two of five are apostles. There was obviously the one that we think of when we say the name Jude or Judas is Judas Iscariot, the great apostate. Then there's Judas, not Iscariot. Now, if I'm having anything to do with the uh, writing of this and def identification of the apostles, and my name is Judas also, I'm going to say, hey, my name is Judas, not Iscariot. <laughs> Let's get that clear, especially after the denial of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then there's Judas of Damascus. He's uh, the guy who Paul, after being uh, Saul, basically, before he becomes Paul, he's blinded and taken to this particular house of Judas of Damascus. And then the fourth guy was Judas Barsabbas. He's mentioned Acts 16. And then there's Judas, the Lord's brother. Now that's who we're talking about here. Judas, the Lord's brother. Now a lot of people say, well, you know, if you talk to certain people in certain denominations or certain religions like Catholicism, they say, oh, Jesus didn't have any brothers. Remember Mary, she's a perpetual virgin. That's what the Catholic Church teaches. But that's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches that Jesus had brothers and sisters and a mother, and he had a stepfather named Joseph. And if you study the scriptures in Matthew 13, they, remember they're talking about Jesus, and there's kind of the people who are rejecting him. They say, is this not Jesus, the carpenter's son? You know, and are these not his son and mother and brothers? Well, he had half-brothers, and if you look at the scriptures long enough and study them, you'll find out he had several brothers that are named in scripture. There's James, Joseph, Simon, and then here's Jude, or Judas. Mark 6 says, are these not his sisters and brothers that are here with us? Now, if he is the brother of Jesus, or the half-brother of Jesus, why doesn't he say so? I believe he's just stressing his humility for the most part. Remember, prior to the death and the resurrection of Jesus, they came and they were around, but you don't see a lot of commitment to them. But after the resurrection of Jesus, you know, uh, you see James getting saved. James becomes the head of the church of Jerusalem. He's not James the Apostle, he's James the, the half-brother of Jesus Christ. In fact, James, when he writes his letter, and we'll be doing this in our list studies in, uh, in, in January, our elders, along with our staff, are, are writing a particular study out of the book of James for our lift groups. And we'll discover that James, it's not the Apostle James, it's James, the half-brother of Jesus. But James uses the same terminology, I, I'm the servant of Christ. But, you know, I, I don't know... I, there were six kids in my family. My mom's here today. Uh, she was good about never comparing, but can you imagine growing up with Jesus in the house? <laughs> Why can't you be like your brother Jesus? <laughs> or man, after, after the wedding of Cana, when that thing happens, you know, Jesus, you, uh, if you're a half-brother Jesus, you're never going to go to a wedding. <laughs> because you know it's going to happen. Somebody's going to come up to you and say, uh, James, Jude, we're out of wine here. 
And, uh, you know, I was at a wedding recently, and your brother was there. And just a little too much pressure for me anyway. <laughs> Maybe you have to go up in a bigger home to think about it. I don't know. My twisted way of thinking. But th these guys are humble enough that they don't come out and try to wave their credentials this way. They just say, servant of the Lord Jesus Christ and the brother. So they, they, they respond with, obviously, this humility. Now, I know the Catholics will tell you this. They'll say, well, when it says brothers and stuff, it really doesn't mean that. That's a mistranslation of Scripture, and it really means cousins. But that's not a mistranslation of Scripture. The word is, in the Greek language, adelphos, which means from the same womb. You can't be a cousin and come from the same womb. Most of us are familiar with that, all right? But as Jude, as he, as he starts to write this epistle, uh, it, it's like there's this m mention in verse 3. He's almost sidetracked. He said, I'm making every effort to write to you about the common salvation. In other words, I, there's this great move, I, I desire to write this letter, but I felt the necessity to write to you appealing that you contend earnestly for the faith which was once de all, for all delivered down to the saints. What's he saying? I started to write to you just about our common salvation, write to you about what, what it really means to, to know the Lord and our walk with Christ. He said, but the Holy Spirit interrupted me. That's basically what this necessity came over me to write to you about something else, that we should earnestly contend for the faith. And he calls it the faith, and we'll talk a little bit more about that week. But it, it, as you follow the letter through, and it, it is a marvelous letter, he begins with something unique in this letter. You get to verse 1 and 2, we'll look at in just a moment. He talks about how that, you know, we're the saints of God, and, and he deals with this issue of what we'll call, for the lack of better terminology, the security of the believer. Now catch the book again. The theme of the book is apostasy, what it means to be a counterfeit believer. But he starts out this letter. In fact, he ends the letter with the same thing. It's like, here's the, the meat of the letter is apostasy, but it's sandwiched in between these two things called the security of the believer. Eternal salvation being eternal. So he begins this important letter about falling away, by making a point about what it really means that if you are a believer, that you are secure, and that this doesn't apply to you in regard to losing your salvation, but you need to be aware as a true believer that there will be those in the midst of you who are not genuine believers. And he gives four great truths as he starts this letter and he ends the letter. He makes the four points, and he talks about you as a Christian. He says, you're the called. And he says, you're the kept. And you're the loved or the beloved. And then he calls you the blessed. And he tells you how you're blessed. So understand that if you are a genuine believer, someone who's truly put their faith in Christ, a follower of Jesus, someone who's taken up the cross and decided to follow Jesus, he's, he's saying that it, you're, you're, you don't have to worry because you've been called, you're kept, you're loved, and you're blessed. Let me just take a moment to talk about each one of these words. In fact, when we get to this word calling, uh, it's at the end of the sentence in verse 1. He says, Jude, to the, to the, to the call... By the way, in the Greek language, when something is placed at the end of a sentence, it's there for, for a reason. It deals with a, uh, a, the importance of the statement. Whereas in English, we put it at the first of the sentence. The Greeks would put it at the end of the sentence. So basically, it should read something like this. Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to them that are the called ones. This letter is to you that are the saved. And Christian is someone that, by the way, is a call. Now, I'm going to try to explain something that that uh, I can't explain. And anybody who tells you they can is lying to you. Or they're slightly deluded, even though they may be a good godly brother. It just has to do with the calling and the election, the predestination of the saints. We know that then if you've been around Christianity very long at all, there's kind of two camps in this regard. There's one we call the Reformed theologians, or more commonly known as the Calvinists. And on the other hand, you have the Arminians. Most denominations break down into one of those two. One says that we're basically the called of God, and there's nothing you can do about it if you're the called of God. You're going to get saved no matter what. You can't resist it. It's irresistible grace. Then on the other hand, you have a group that says, oh, well, you know, it's, it's, it has everything to do with you. And they'll argue, oh, it has nothing to do with you. And they'll say, yes, it has everything. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, thou shalt be saved. How can you be saved without believing in the Lord Jesus Christ? Oh, well, if you're the called of God, you will call on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so back and forth it goes like a ping pong game. Neither camp realizing that somewhere lying in the middle is the truth. Who was it, D.L. Moody or one of the great preachers of the past that says, you know, the day is going to come. If you're a child of God, you're going to be brought into the presence of God. And as you enter in the gates of heaven, there'll be that great scripture, whosoever will may come. We paste it over the door. And as you walk through the gates rejoicing and look over your shoulder, you'll see another scripture says, called from the foundations of the earth. 
marrying those two is a difficult task for most people. And I believe it probably is a truth belongs in that great vault of the mysteries of God that God will open up to us one day. The scripture says the deep things belong to the Lord. And the Lord reveals them to us as He wills and when He wills. And there is this marriage that most people can't make out of these two points. I do believe that it, it happens in the scriptures. So he starts with this concept of the called. And as you study the Bible, from what I see, there's two kind of things that are mentioned around the call. One is what we'll call the general call, and another would be an efficacious call. Now, as I get into this point, most people on this side of the camp would say, hey, yeah, he's got it. Right, it's it. There's that effectual call. The general call is the call that all goes out to all men to come, repent, receive Jesus Christ. Jesus said, come unto me, all you that are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. So there's that call that goes out. John 7. Jesus saying, if any man will come after me. It's, the, it's, it's, the, it's a holy day. It's a feast day. Jesus stands up, and he, the water's being poured out. And he says, I'll give you to drink of the water of life. But you have to come. You have to make a decision. You have to drink. Revelation says, closes, and the Bible says, and the spirit and the bride say, come. So there's this invitation, this call to make a decision, to step out by faith and be recognized with Jesus Christ and to, to, to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. So that, that's that first element of what the call is. That's that general call. It, it, Isaiah says, seek you the Lord while he may be found. Call you upon him you while he is near. By the way, this particular call is resisted. It can be resisted. Luke 14, 16 is that parable of the great feast. Jesus says, when they didn't show, go out into highways and byways and compel them to come in. And everybody that will come in can come in. But not everybody came in. We know that. He had to send them out to make another call for people to come in. This is that word in scriptures in Hebrews 12. I believe it's in verse 15 when he says, How shall you escape if you neglect if you, if you hear and don't believe, there's no hope for you. There's, there's this response part at this call of God. There's one response is to reject it. To reject it means you go from bad to worse to worse. I mean, it's kind of like you say, well, I believe this is hell now. Well, it could be if you don't know Jesus. And so it really will be hell to hell to hell to hell. If you choose correctly, responding to the call of the Holy Spirit on your life, and by the way, God initiates this, all right? It is the Lord's work. We're dead in our trespass and sin. He comes, and by the power of the Word of God, He gives us truth, and it wakes us up to respond. And here at this point, we respond negatively and say, I don't want that. I don't want to hear that. I want to live my own life. Then, you know, that's worse to worse. To accept it, it goes from good to better to glory. It just gets better and better. That's the general call that men hear. There's that second element, though, with what we call is, is the efficacious call. And that is a word which has to do with, uh, it's an effective call. It's mentioned in Romans 1 and 1 Corinthians a couple of times, Revelation 17, where the Scriptures makes this point over and over that we are the called ones of God. We're the chosen of God. We're the called of God. Uh, Revelation, that's verse 14 out of 17. We are the called, chosen, and faithful. Don't you like that? So there's this, this call, we'll see, what makes the difference between just this general call and this effective call? Still gets back to this part of humanity which has to believe to receive this element of, of, of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 15, He that has called you is holy, so you be holy. He's called me to what? To live for Him, to love Him, to, to be holy. But there is this point where I have to not only here, I respond. And upon this response, to respond in faith to Jesus Christ, God does something supernatural. This call becomes effective in my life. I, it, it's like it's two parts God and one part man. But again, if you're in that camp or that camp, you have a hard time bringing those two together. Because I do believe it goes much deeper than what most people can understand. I love what Romans 8 says, verses 28 and 29, when it says, We know that God causes all things to work together for good. Can I get a hallelujah? Amen. To those who, are, to those who love God and to those who are called according to His purpose. But catch this, those who foreknown, He also predestined to become conformed to the image of His Son, that He might be the firstborn among many dead. Now, what's he saying here? Well, some people take this verse and say, well, it's all about election. God just, he calls an election. But no, he's saying, if you are the called, if you've been one of the chosen because you've accepted this invitation from Christ, then you have been called and predestined to be like Jesus. Amen. I mean, that's pretty much what the verse says, isn't it? He's also predestined to become 
conformed to the image of his son, the firstborn among many brethren. So it's, it's one of those mysteries of, of God that it's simple yet profound, and on one side is true, on the other side is true, but there is a marriage to these things that he calls us to himself, and if we respond to it, then we're justified, and those who respond to the call are justified, made right with God, and if we're justified, he says, then we're sanctified, and if we're sanctified, then we're glorified, we're going to be in heaven with Jesus. Difficult? I don't understand completely how my choice relates to the sovereignty of God, but I do believe what the, what the Bible says. If I believe, I'm saved, but also believe I am the elect of God. Why do I believe that? Because that's what the Bible says. And it really secures me to know that he called me, that his sovereign hand is on my life, and it's on your life if you've trusted Christ. So as he talks about apostasy, he says, get this down. You're the called of God. You're not the apostate. You're the called of God. And then he goes on and he uses another terminology. He said, but you're also the beloved or the loved, as one translation says. One of the great securing factors is that God the Father considers me beloved. That the scripture calls me a beloved one. The verb is a perfect participle. You say, what do you mean by that? Well, in the Greek language, a perfect participle basically says that something was done in the past that was effective in the past, but it's still effective today. In other words, Jesus demonstrated his love for God so loved the the world that he gave his only begotten son. He did that in the past. It was powerful, it was supernatural, but it's still powerful and it's still supernatural. And if anybody will believe what was done in the past by Jesus, they can have the present God in their life today. It's a perfect tense. It means a a past action with continuing results. God is still working. God's still loved. Settled in the past. In the timeless past, in the mind of God, he knew me. He loved me. He sent his son to die for me. He came as my substitute. And if I choose him, has an effective work in my life today. John 14 says it this way. In John 14, he says, Jesus answered and said unto him, If any man love me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him, and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. He says in John 16, For the Father himself loves you, because you love me, and have believed that I came out from God. What's he saying? God loves you, and you've chosen to love him. And because you've chosen to love me, my Father loves you. And he goes on to say, basically, my Father loves me like he loves you. Because you believed me. So you are loved by God. You write this down, John 17, verse 22 and 23. Jesus is praying in John 17. This is prior to the crucifixion, day before or so. And he said, the glory, Father, which you have given me, I have given them. That they may be one, just as you and I are one. I in them, and thou in me. That they may be made perfect in one that the world may know that thou hast sent me and hast loved them as thou hast loved me. What's he saying? God, do this work in them. You love me, they're in me now. They've trusted me. Therefore, you love them. And you love them. He closes that verse with saying, and you love them like you love me. Now, how much does the Father love Jesus? As much as possible. Then if Jesus is loved by the Father that much, with all the love of God, How much does the Father love me? Hallelujah. He loves me the same. That's why Ephesians 1, 6 says, We're in the apostles' praying. We are accepted, received by God, accepted in the beloved. Ephesians 2, 4 talks about the great love wherewith he loved us. Even though we were dead in our trespasses and sin, even though we denied God and were God-haters by nature, God loved us in His Son to die for us and now has spread that love in our hearts. Romans 5 talks about the love of God being shed abroad in our heart by the Holy Spirit. God's given us His massive, holy, supernatural love. So I do believe in the security of the believer. Some people call it once saved, always saved. That's not a big popular doctrine anymore. A lot of people don't believe that. Maybe some here today say, why do you believe it? Well, I think it's pretty simple in my case. I'm a simple guy, and I just believe what the Bible says for the most part. And I've discovered some truths that we all need to discover. One is that God loves me as much as he loves Jesus. So how do I know I'm secure? One is the great love of God. That's how I know. God loves me. 
with an eternal, everlasting, supernatural love. And two, <clears throat> there's nobody bigger than God. <laughs> God has the power, literally, to hang on to me. So if we take this little formula, absolute love plus absolute power equals security. Do the math. Absolute love, absolute power, I can't lose. I'm secure. You can't beat a deal like that. If, let me make it simple. If Christ loved me when I didn't love him, I'd use God's name in vain. I did what I wanted. I rejected the truth of the gospel. I'd go where I want, live where I want, act how I want. It, I was important. And even while that was going on in humanity, God sent his son to die. To die for all of us. I believe that as I've trusted him, he's going to love me with a love that never fails. The greatest reason, obviously, I believe in the security of the believer is love. 1 John 3, John says, Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God, brought into the family. What kind of love is that? That's the kind of love that is exhibited in the death of the Lord Jesus Christ, the power of the Lord Jesus Christ, the, the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ which therein lies the second source of our security, that we are the beloved, not just the called, the beloved. Jeremiah, I love this scripture. The Lord appeared unto me of old unto me, saying, Yea, I have loved thee with an everlasting love, therefore with loving kindness I have drawn thee. Isn't that a great passage? How much God loves I know sometimes we get so down ourselves, and, and we ought to at times, amen? When we don't, when we don't do, do as God calls. But we still need to remember, even in that point, God loved me. I mean, just turn to somebody and say, God loves me. Go ahead and tell. They need to hear it too. I mean, you might even add, God loves you too. Try that. I know it's a little difficult. Go ahead and look at each other. One time. That didn't hurt, did it? Praise God. God loves me. Now, some of you know me. <laughs> and you know, do you know how big a miracle that is? Amen. God loves me, and God loves you. That's the glory that once I've trusted and received that love. Jeremiah, Isaiah went on to say, another great prophet of God, can a woman forget her suckling child, that she should not have compassion on the son of her womb? Yea, they may forget, yet I will not forget thee. Behold, I have graven thee upon the palms of my hand. The, thy walls are continually before me. And especially... What did Thomas say when he said, I won't believe it's Jesus till I see the palms, the scars in his hands? That's the testimony, even prophetically spoken of in Isaiah 49. I have engraved that my love for you on the palms of my hand. Romans 5.10, for when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son. Much more being reconciled now, we shall be saved by his life. In other words, we have what we need. If when we were enemies, if when we were against God, God demonstrated his love, how much more so now that we are in his family and we are his children. The death of Christ saves us because of the love of Christ. The life of Christ saves us because of the love of Christ. We are the called, and we are the loved. But it doesn't stop there. There's a third term he uses where he says, we are the kept, or the preserved. By the way, Christmas is just a few months away, and some of y'all know what preserves are. Don't forget the pastor. <laughs> the kept, though, this is not those kind of preserves, by the way, but we are preserved. But the idea in the Greek language here is the word tehera, and it is a word which has to do with guarding something that is like a precious treasure, and you watch over it as a vigil. So basically, God is guarding me. I am the kept. I'm guarded by God, all right? God, God is a good guard, all right? If he's the guard, I am secure completely. What did Jesus say? No man's able to pluck you from my Father's hand. Why? Because God's guarding you. God is vigilant. He never sleeps. He never slumbers. You're taken care of in the morning. You're taken care of in the day. You're taken care of in the night. All through the night. All through the day. There's, there's no time where God is not this keeping and preserving and protecting you. He is your guard as well as your God. Therefore, Jesus, nobody, you know, pluck you out of the Father's hand. If you're having doubts about your salvation, listen, you need to remember the power of Christ. We said absolute love plus absolute power equals security. 2 Timothy chapter 4, 18. He says, he, the Lord will rescue, will rescue me from every evil deed and he will bring me safely to his heavenly kingdom. 
That's powerful, is it not? The Lord will do right. You say, well, Brother Joe, I'm headed for sin. And man, I'm just, and most of the time, if you listen to the Holy Spirit, you don't have to get there. But if you do get there, God is going to send His Holy Spirit with great conviction. He's going to convict your heart. It's like a mother standing there and reproving her son. You're wrong. You need to apologize. You need to get right. That's the Holy Spirit's ministry in your life is to bring about the fullness of Christ in your life. And so he shows you where you're wrong. And you say, well, what if I don't get right? Then he'll be like a good parent. He'll chasten you. All right? Because what is it? You have this commitment. The Apostle Paul said, God's going to rescue you from every evil deed and will bring you safely into the heavenly kingdom. So if you're living in doubts today, you don't have to live in doubts. You don't have to go to bed at night afraid of what might, tomorrow might bring or the night might bring or what the day just brought. Hey, you're safe in the arms of the Lord Jesus Christ and your heavenly Father. 2 Timothy 1.12 For the which cause I suffer these things. Nevertheless, I'm not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed. I am persuaded, hallelujah, that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. Amen. Say I'm going to make it all the way to heaven in both these verses, what he's saying. No matter what, I'm going to get there. By the great power of God, I'm going to get there. Why? Because I made a commitment to Jesus. Basically, I think both of these come down, and his commitment's bigger than mine. <laughs> if I do head that direction to the evil, his commitment's bigger than my commitment. That's the covenant relationship. And I've said it before, you've heard me say it before, if we ever understood what a covenant was, a God-given, God-sealed, God-kept covenant, we would know and have assurance that we cannot lose our salvation. It's a gift from God. He gives it, he doesn't take it back. We have this promise. John 17, 11, you write this one in, I didn't put it on the scripture, but it says, Jesus, I have no more in the world. This is part of that prayer again. But these, these that follow me, they're in the world, and I come to you, heavenly, holy Father, Keep through your name those whom thou hast given me that they may be one as we are. Jesus never prayed outside of the will of God. And praying in the will of God assures you that your prayers will be answered. The Bible says this is the confidence that we have, that we know if we ask anything of him according to his will, we'll receive these promises. That's what John says. So if God answers prayers that are according to his will, Jesus said, Father, deliver them all the way in, all the way home, then you can be assured of the fact, hey, Jesus prayed it, it will be completed and it will be done. He also said in that same prayer, I pray, Father, that you shouldn't take them out of the world. It's not time for the rapture yet, folks. It'll come when it comes. God's leaving. He said, but don't take them out of the world, but keep them from the evil. Which leads me to that next point, all right? That we're just, we, we are the called, we're the loved, and as Jesus said, we are the kept. You say, well, how, how, how does he do that? I mean, how can we be the kept? Well, Hebrews 7 puts it simply, you know, wherefore he's able to save them to the uttermost that are coming to God by him, seeing that he ever lives to make intercession for them. What is Jesus doing in the heavenlies before the throne of God? He's making intercession for you. You need a lawyer when you stand before this judge. And the great judge of all time has given you, once you trust his son, a court-appointed lawyer. But he's not like the world's court-appointed lawyers. This lawyer has never lost a case. All right? He wins every case. And so that if I fail, we know that the Bible talks about the accuser of the brethren. He stands before God to accuse us before God. Jesus stands there and says, that's out of order, I object. <laughs> What's the boundary grounds for your objection? They are safe, they are clean, they are holy because I took their place so the judgment of death does not fall upon them because it has already fallen upon me. Yeah. I paid the price. The sentence has been served. Not guilty. We have this guarantee from the Lord, basically. Hebrews 9 even goes on to tell us this, For Christ is not in the holy place made with, with hands, not the temple, not the tabernacle, which are just the figures of the true, but Christ has entered into heaven itself now to appear. Get this, this, is, this ought to cause you to shout the rest of the day. He's entered into the presence of God for us. He's there for you right now. Why? So you won't go to hell. <laughs> the price is paid. 
The judge stands ready to hear the case of this lawyer because it's his son. Uh, if you ever go to court, you want to make sure your lawyer is the judge's son. <laughs> it helps, amen? Lastly, that's the reason I was a little late getting here to this service. I just got a little long-winded. There's so much good stuff here. We could go on forever. We're the blessed ones. That's why we can't lose our salvations. Verse 2, may mercy and peace and love be multiplied. He says, God will multiply mercy. God multiplies peace. God multiplies love. I mean, adding mercy, peace, and love is pretty good, but multiplying is better. Amen. You get a lot more a lot faster when you start multiplying instead of adding. <laughs> he multiplies this. He, in other words, he keeps pouring it out. I mean, let, let's think about it for a moment. If you believe you could lose your salvation, what makes you think that? Well, people say, well, it's sin, you know. God hates sin. God hates sin. So, you know, sin's the reason that, that ultimately that, that I, I could lose my salvation. The issue is sin. But what does the scripture say? That he multiplies mercy. When it's needed, he gives it. He multiplies it. Why, Why does he keep multiplying? Because we keep rebelling. We're disobedient. So when we fail, he multiplies his mercy. Another reason, well, Brother Joe, you know, the Bible says we're saved by faith, but what, what, if, what, if I, what if I quit faithing and, and doubt enters in and anxiety, anxiety and the turmoil and confusion and all these things where I'm not really believing anymore. The Bible says he multiplies peace. But we're living in such a world of anxiety and such a world of fear and such a world of turmoil so the doubts do come. And I, I remember before I really got a grip on the Word of God, I'd, I'd have doubts about my salvation. I, am I really saved? Do I really know Jesus? And most of the time, I would go back and I'd measure it by what I'd done. Well, I did walk an aisle and I did pray a prayer and I did get baptized and I did go to church and I did give some money and I did read my Bible and I did pray. The Bible says not of works. So just throw that list out. I trust him. He called me. I responded. He loved me. He keeps me. He guards me. This is where we believe the Bible instead of believing our own logic. M man's logic said, well, if you offend me, I'm getting out. you're no longer my friend. God's grace covers all that. His mercy covers all that. And his peace covers all that. That's why he said, I give you a peace. It's beyond anything the world understands. Because the world doesn't understand that kind of love and that kind of mercy and that kind of peace. So when the doubts come, he gives me the peace and multiplies it to me. Well, Brother Joe, I, I, what if I just stop loving God and, and I just quit committing and, you know, I backslide. You know, I have a tendency to leak. <laughs> my love just leaks out and my faith leaks out. What's he say? He multiplies love to us. This is just another guarantee for the saint. This is just another guarantee for the believer. And Jude gets into this letter. He says, you know, this fearful apostasy is coming. There's going to be a lot of people who profess to know Christ that don't know Christ. And they're going to begin to deny the lordship of Jesus and deny the word of God and deny the truths of God's word. And we're already there, folks. It's happening all around us. All around us, we have, we have denominations or abominations that have, that have denied the inerrancy of Scripture, that the Word of God is really the God-breathed, inspired Word of God. They reject that now. They kind of, well, it's maybe inspired in spots, and we're kind of inspired to spot the spots. Yeah. They, they, they just they don't believe the truth. They don't believe in the virgin birth anymore. Many denominations, many, many denominations and churches have moved away from the, the resurrection the blood, they take the blood out of the, the hymnals, out of the translations of the Bible. They just move it off. We don't, want, we don't want to deal with that anymore. I mean, the issues of morality, probably more than anything else, show how far we've come from our faith in the Word of God. When God says something is sin, we just say, well, it's an alternative lifestyle now. Yeah. The, the, the Catholic Pope came out this last week talking about homosexual priests. He said, well, I, you know, as long as they're well-intentioned, I guess they're okay. Were they well-intentioned in the molesting of those little children? No, it's sin. It's not okay. It's not about being well-intentioned. Bishop Desmond Tutu out of South Africa made the great statement, I would never serve, this is just last week, I would never serve a homophobic God. Well, let me tell you, there is no homophobic God. God's not phobic about anything. Homosexuals, adulterers, fornicators, liars, cheats, and thieves. In fact, the Bible says such were some of you. Yeah. Till you gave your life to Christ and then you were changed. Yeah. Yeah. And someone cornered me after I left the service this morning. And the reason I was a little late, I explained clearly to him. He said, well, I have some homosexual friends that I'd like to bring to church. They're not going to be welcome here. I said, they'd be more than welcome here. You know, we love sinners. 
God loves sinners. Bring them. The more the merrier. Load them up. Amen. That's why I'm on board. That's why you're on board, because God loves sinners. Well, they were born that way. I said, I know. <laughs> you are so close to truth, you don't even know. Bibles are all born sinners. But I don't go do something just because I'm a sinner anymore. I got saved and God gave me the power to do what's right. I said, I could wake up this morning and say, I would like a lot of money, and the quickest way to go to it is rob the bank. And the cops haul me off to jail. I'm not going to declare my civil rights. I was born this way. You need to accept me and be tolerant of my bank robbing. I'm a bank robber by birth. We're liars by birth. We're cheats by birth. We steal by... It's our nature to sin. It's, it's, it's what you are that causes you to do what you do. Yes, we're all born sinners. One may be adulterous in their temptations, adultery or fornication or homosexuality or lying, whatever. It's still all sin. And God says that's a filthy sin. I mean, he makes it very clear in Romans chapter 1. It's an abominable sin. But nonetheless, we're all sinners. And here's God in his great love and mercy. He says, you know, you can embrace the truth and receive life. And, you know, we don't have to be afraid, though, once we've received the life. So Jude, I said, remember I said he kind of sandwiches. And that's kind of the first verse. I'll just show you the last verse, and we'll be done with that. You can study it on your own. Verse 24 says, Now to him who's able to keep you from stumbling and to make you stand in the presence of his glory, blameless with great joy. Amen. Now, I, I, I'm, I'm kind of, I haven't spent as much time on that one verse as I'd like, but I think kind of what he's saying here, that I'm going to stand with great joy, or is it God saying, I'm going to be happy to see you? I think it's the latter just as much as it's the first. That God's going to be happy when I get to heaven. You say, well, do you believe that? Yeah, because the Bible tells me in the Old Testament, precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of a saint. And if you're a child of God, a called child of God, preserved, kept, and loved by God, secure in Him, then, hey, God's going to be glad to see you when you get home. What parent isn't? What parent isn't? So we rejoice, and we don't have to be afraid of this, of this coming apostasy. I believe that once I commit my life to Jesus, genuinely, I'm saved. I just happen to be the school, once saved, always saved. But let me reiterate, once saved, have you really given your life to Christ? You know? There's a lot of people who kind of maybe have to go to it two or three times. I think I had to go, I, I was a double dipper. I think I got baptized. I got, I got dunked once and baptized once. <laughs> you know? First time I got, because, you know, other brothers and sisters were getting saved. Mama's so happy. I like when Mama's happy, so I got saved. <laughs> she was happy. She was more happy when I really got saved, though. <laughs> when I really made a commitment to Christ. Some of y'all have been baptized so many times, your skin's starting to wrinkle. <laughs> hey, as long as it takes, sooner or later, amen, whatever it takes, I'll keep baptizing until you feel secure, amen. But what, we'll get you there one way or the other. But here's the, look at the life of those who are saved. We're loved by the Father. We're kept by the Father. We're called by the Father. We're secure in the Father. Isn't that glorious? We're called the blessed one, and he's multiplying the blessings of God. Calling to life and liberty. And it's exemplified. So how do you know? Follow the trail. Where Jesus is going, we're going. We may try to detour occasionally, but hey, we're following Christ. Would you stand with your heads bowed today? If you don't have that kind of...